grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Amen. Brethren, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. O God, makes me to save us. O, o Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name. St. Mary of the Annunciation in Bedminster once housed the bones, or the alleged bones, of St. Jothwell in the Chantry Chapel of Robert Gray, which was dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Jothwell in the south aisle of the Norman Church that preceded this one. The associated, the associated Vicina over there has been retained and can still be seen. The chantry and nearby well became a place of pilgrimage, where miracles of solace and healing were wrought. In due course, Jathwear's bones were appropriated first by Sherborne Abbey and finally by Salisbury Cathedral, which was initially at Old Serum, when the diocese moved there in the 11th century. There was a cult of St. Jothware in Bemminster, though she is more strongly associated with Hallstock. While the elements of her martyrdom are clear enough, there is disagreement about where this took place. Until the quiet woman public house in Hallstock closed, its inn sign depicting a beheaded woman was a constant reminder of her legend. There is a vivid picture of Juthwear's stepbrother Barner cutting off her head with a mighty slash of his sword in a decorated capital letter in Bishop Osmond of Salisbury's 12th century Serum Antiphona. It is said that St. Juthwear, or Judith as she is sometimes known, was of noble birth, born in Cornwall, and that she had a brother, St. Aurelian, and two sisters, Sidwell and Walvela, who also became saints. 
It is recorded that Jathwear's bones were translated to Sherbin under Bishop Aylwood II in about 1059, but she would have been born four or five hundred years before that. From her early life, Jathwear devoted herself to serving God and performing good works, including caring for the pilgrims who visited her father's house. Wife, our story begins sometime in the first half of the first millennium. Juthwe's brother and two sisters have left home. She's living with her parents, Father Benner and his wife, somewhere near Hallstock. It is winter time and there's a cheerful fire in the fireplace. One day Juthwe comes in out of the cold and says, Father, there's a pilgrim at the door. He says he's on his way to Whitchurch Canonicorum. He's lame and on crutches for an inflamed leg, and he hopes for a cure at St Candida's altar. Can I ask him in? Please, he looks so tired, and he can hardly walk. Her father, Benner, asked her mother if that would be all right, and she said, Of course you can, my darling. I'm sure we can prepare some porridge and a mug of beer for him. He might like to take a rest in the barn overnight. Jathwe turned and tripped merrily out of the door to invite the pilgrim in. Benna said, I love young Jathwe. She's so sweet and kind and never argues like some young ladies do these days. She spreads so much happiness wherever she goes. Her mother replied, I wish I could spend more time with her, but I've been so tired lately, and my cough seems to be getting worse. After a pause, Benna said, I expect it's just a winter cold. There's a lot of it about. And he was struck with a fit of coughing himself. consumption. Father is lost without a housekeeper and marries again as soon as he can. His new Welsh wife, Goneril, however, is more interested in his wealth than she is in him. And her bad-tempered son, Barna, not to be confused with Benna, is about as unhelpful as a young man can be. Sometimes, some months later, father dies too. Now, 
Both Jathwa's parents are dead. Her stepmother Goneril now runs the household. One day Goneril came in mixing something in a bowl. Jathwa was behind her. She came round in front of Goneril and asked if she minded being called mother. Goneril replied in a grumpy manner that she supposed not. Jathwa explained that she had a problem with pain in her chest and needed advice and help. Goneril responded by saying unsympathetically that she was too busy making Barna's favourite pudding as the poor boy was looking distinctly peaky and needed building up. At this point, Barna comes in, dressed in a party-coloured costume and carrying his sword. Goneril brightens up and asks him sweetly how he is feeling. Barna peers into his mother's bowl and asks her what the revolting-looking mess was supposed to be. Goneril bridled and snapped that it would be a nice change if he could try to be pleasant occasionally. Barna looks up and notices Jothware and snarls at her to push off as he wants to talk to his mother. She apologises humbly and leaves. some time before replying that her breasts were getting bigger and hurting her. Goneril stared at her for a while and finally advised her to go to the dairy for a soft cheese, to cut it in half and bind half a cheese to each breast. That would soothe them. Jathwear thanked her, but just as she was leaving to go to the dairy, Barna barged in, full of complaints about his mother's pudding, and asking her honey to make it edible. Goneril sighed and said that she had been hoping to be thanked for her efforts to please him. Barna said, in a mock, humble voice, Thank you so much, Mother, for this extremely delicious pudding that must have dropped straight from heaven untouched by human hands. Is that thank you enough? She ignored him at first and then advised him to keep a close eye on his stepsister, especially on her chest, but wouldn't say why. Barna was intrigued, but Goneril wouldn't say any more. Yeah. 
The very next day, Goneril killed and dismembered a sheep and threw the remains into the nearby wood for the wolves to devour during the night. The day after that, she persuaded Barna to go with her to the wood. She showed him the remains and told him that his stepsister had miscarried there, and this was all that was, and all this offal was all that was left of the miscarriage. At first, Barna didn't believe her. No one as pious as Jaffwer would do such a thing. So she told him to go and fetch the girl and confront her with the bloody remains. He did as she was asked. He did as she asked and brought the frightened girl into the wood and he was carrying his sword. When Jathwer gathered what they were accusing her of, she just stood there, trembling, the cheese juice trickling down her bodice and into her underclothes, too upset to speak. Roaring that she was a slut and a whore, Barna unsheathed his sword and struck off her head as she stood. It fell with a sickening thud and she collapsed beside it. But from now on, all Jathwer's household and possessions were theirs. Goneril and Barna stood petrified by the sight of Jathwer's pathetic corpse and the awful deed they just performed. Barna recovered first and stooped to wipe, the, to wipe his bloody sword on the grass. As he did so, the corpse began to move and crawl. She picked up her head and staggered towards the nearby church. Mother and son clutched each other and followed the girl as she entered the church, where she managed to lift her own head and place it on the altar before collapsing for good. that Jathwer was declared a saint by the local people and Barna was reviled by one and all. Barna finally understood that it was his appalling behaviour, driven by jealousy of Jathwer's goodness and pity, magnified by his mother's powerful influence, rather than his sense of family honour that brought about this terrible deed. He was never arraigned for this murder, but in an attempt at procuring redemption, he changed his ways, eventually founding a monastery on a British battlefield at Le Relic in France, and spent the rest of his life there as a monk. <coughs> the story doesn't relate what became of her stepmother, but some hundreds of years later, a chantry chapel was built in the south aisle of the Norman predecessor of this church. It is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Jothwear and the Piscina can still be seen. Her sacred bones were moved around and even said to have been held a while in here, in this very church. 
before being moved to Sherborne and then to Old Sarum and finally to the new cathedral at Salisbury. There is no trace of them now. Just where sacred day is the 28th of November and her symbols are two cheeses and a sword. Thank you. 